Okay. Then let's look into some previous exams. And let's start uh, with the one from 2009. This is Norwegian, so I'll try to, ex to uh, translate. Okay, uh, it says here that the aids here there is no written aids, and it should be allowed with a calculator. So this was this exam. Do you want to have open book exam? We can make a decision on that. Normally we, we haven't had that in this course, and I, I would really recommend that we do not, because if there is an open book exam, then it will have to be more difficult. And I would like as many as possible to pass the exam. So, do we have an agreement? Yes, it seems so. I don't see any rush on having an open book exam here. So, you will have to read these two textbooks, memorize the central parts, was what you need to know what is about these best reply functions, about these Nash equilibria, about these expected values and these kind of stuff. That is something you need to, to master. Um, and of course, in general, be able to do some logical arguments. That's uh, kind of what we, I would like to test you on. But as I said, these exams are in general much easier than the, the exercises. So let's see what we have here, okay? This one starts with a figure which has a subtext saying that penalty as penalty kick as a simultaneous game. So um, here we kind of see a figure that you perhaps should remember them from the curriculum. And it says here in the introduction to the first exercise, as you probably see, I normally put a percentage on each, each of the exercises, meaning that this first exercise is counting half of the exam. So each exercise will get a percentage, and I will use that when I correct it. In general, these percentages are constructed uh, on the amount of work in the exercise, and to some very slight extent, perhaps, to the amount of difficultness. Okay, so a more difficult exercise would get a bigger weight. And then, of course, based on my judgment. So in A here, you're asked to explain the difference between a simultaneous and a sequential game. And this is the kind of answer you must kind of have in your head then, in, in this form of the exam, and the, the answer should be relatively straightforward. In a simultaneous game, players will have to make their gaming decisions without observing their opponent. In a sequential game, at least one of the players are able to observe the other player's action before he or she has to take his or her decision. Of course, depending on the structure of a sim simultaneous game, like for instance in chess, you will have a lot of observations, okay? Because it doesn't stop after two, two rounds, as this free kick uh, game we looked at. So in most sequential games, a lot of information is available as you move along. But in a simultaneous game, the information is not present when you will have to make up your mind. And the, the, the naming should kind of indicate the same. Simultaneous, you have to make decisions at the same time, so to speak, without observing. While in a sequence, you can observe what happened previous in the sequence. So this is uh, something you can answer, uh, perhaps not as long as I answered it now. It's always a good idea to try to answer relatively shortly and relatively precisely. Okay, any questions? That one? No, then we move to B. And it says, to what extent does the rules for a penalty kick today as opposed to the previous rules, have consequences for the choice between a simultaneous, for the choice of a simultaneous game formulation. State reasons for your answers. And there is a footnote here, let's see what the footnote says. 
it says something about today's rules. To in today's rules, the keeper is allowed to move along the line before the shot is performed. As opposed to the old rule, where the keeper had to stand still before the shoot, shoot was executed. So I'm kind of giving you the rules as well here then, as a footnote. And we have discussed this, haven't we, already in this course. And you're uh, supposed to answer here something related to the fact that uh, the old rules are more in correspondence with the choice of a modeling simultaneous game than the new rules. But of course, if you want to push your grade up to an A, you can say even then, even still. Um, yeah, there's something we need to discuss. Should I make both a Norwegian and an English exon? You would prefer that? That makes a lot more work for me. It would be better, like, if there's only an Inca taking the exam in English, it would... Yeah, but it would be a greater challenge for you, wouldn't it? You would, you would even have to be preparing for writing English. Maybe, maybe that's a bit too much. So, of course, the optimal thing for you would be that there was an exam in English as well as an exam in Norwegian, and you could choose which one you would like. I assume the Norwegian speaking then would choose a Norwegian exam, and the Yenka would choose an English exam. And you would write in English Yenka, and the rest of you would write in Norwegian. Should we do it like that? Okay, then we do it like that. Then I just have to. I can use Google Translate, you know. I can write it in English first, and then I use Google Translate to make it Norwegian. That's that's quite fast, isn't it? Okay, I, I'll do that. Okay, then we have settled that as well. Yeah, that's good. Mm. So the answer here was that the old penalty kick rules were closer to a simultaneous game than the new rules, due to the fact that the keeper is allowed to move, so he can kind of the the executor can can choose to 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 wait and observe what the keeper does before he makes this decision, which kind of obviously opens up for some sequentiality. But my point when I lectured this was to say that even with the new rules, we can defend to use a simultaneous model because if the game is important and the penalty kick is important, then it's very tough to utilize this opportunity to wait out the keeper. Because if you miss them, then you really miss. And most players are so nervous in this situation that they don't dare to do that anyway. So it, it seems much like a simultaneous game, no matter the rules we compare here. That was the kind of answer I would have on B. Then we move into C. And it in C there is a text here, starting here, which has in figure one the p, uh, this p gives the probability of a goal given that the player's executor e, the guy who shoots, and the keeper k, the goalkeeper, both chooses strategy w. So I define here the meaning of p. Okay, so you really don't need to remember that. That is given here as information for you. And based on that information, you're asked to explain the content in the game matrix in figure one. So now you're, you're about to kind of explain why this looks as it looks. So then you have to remember something from the book as well as this information about the P. So this P then is kind of used, you can use that to, to say that, okay, this square down here should contain expected payoff. And then we will have to, you will have to tell that there is an assumption underlying this model about some utility distribution that the executor gets one if there is a goal and the keeper gets zero and the keeper gets one if there is not a goal and zero if there is a goal. These ones are needed to find this, aren't they? Because the probability of a goal then would have to be multiplied by one to get the expected utility for the executor and the opposite, one minus p times one. There is not a goal to get the utility for the keeper. Of course, then you add something which is multiplied by zero, which doesn't contribute. So that explains this one. And then there is some underlying logic here, which you either can remember or actually can deduce here on the exam. Because these numbers here, they must mean something. Because if you look here, here the executor shoots in the middle of the goal. 
and the keeper stands in the middle of the moon. And what, what these numbers tell us then is that the executor gets nothing. The keeper gets one. It should mean that in that case the keeper actually saves the goal. So if he shoots in the middle, which is kind of in accordance with what we discussed. The opposite here, of course, shoots I in the middle and the keeper goes wide and he is not assumed to save with his feet, so then these numbers are reversed, so then it's a goal and the executor is happy while the goalkeeper is unhappy. Same argument here, shoot wide, keeper stands in the middle, of course then there is a goal, given that you can't miss, and that is also something you can deduce from, th from this model. So this is the simplest first model we looked at, no changes here. Either you can remember it, or you can deduce it. Okay, both options are possible here. But that is the kind of answer you have to give on sub-question C. Then it says, explain shortly the concepts of mixed and pure strategies. That's the first part of sub-question D. Then you have to write something about this. Okay. A pure strategy is a choice from the players in Nash Equilibrium where they choose either one strategy or another strategy. So they choose a strategy actually. While a mixed strategy is a situation where they do not choose the strategy but they choose the probability of choosing the strategy. That is the short way of explaining that. And that is perfectly correct. Because if you like you can add a lot here about when these mixed strategies pop up and but you're really not asked to do that here. You're, you're just asked to make to state the difference between these two terms. No, I'm just talking, okay? If you need more explicit information, there is, of course, hopefully available some solutions here. If you look here, there is a solution in Norwegian, which kind of goes through this more formally. You see here, uh, there's a lot here. And if I'm not completely mistaken, Enka, I think this solution is available in the textbook as well. Okay. So there is an English solution as well as a Norwegian solution. So, um, so instead of spending all this time going through this, I'm just giving you the kind of main points of how to solve these exercises. And if you need to go back, you can go into the actual solutions and look more closely. So that was the first part of exercise D, a short explanation on the difference between mixed and pure strategies. How many Nash equilibria does the game in figure 1 have? And of course in figure 1 here we have actually computed the best reply functions so you have them and you're supposed to answer to that one. Of course the correct answer is that it has one Nash equilibrium although you can't see it here. Alternatively you can answer this one has no Nash equilibria in pure strategies but it and then it must have one in mixed strategies. Okay, either of these two answers are correct. And you're not asked to give any more answer than that at this point. Okay? Just pick it. As long as you can see a pure one, it must be a mixed one, according to Nash, Nash's famous theorem. So that was actually the only thing I wanted you to answer on D. Nothing more than that. These two different questions. Then an equation is given here, and if you recognize from the textbook, you will probably see that this is the Nash equilibrium of the simplest of the two penalty kick models we looked at. The one where the executor always hit the goal if he shoots wide. The other one was slightly more complex and also involved a Q. So this is the kind of the first version. It says here that the equation one above gives a Nash equilibrium in the game from figure one in mixed strategies. Here R star and S star gives probabilities for E choosing the M strategy and K choosing the M strategy. So every information bit is given here. Then we move to E and it says assume that for a given league the P is 0 0.75. We did actually make an argument when we discussed this in the lecture that it perhaps could be 0 0.75, but uh, it could be that there are different P's in different leagues here, couldn't it? Yeah. Uh, have one league with the better keepers or with better executors or some kind of mixture there could be different from another league. So, we have given now a P of 0 0.75. What does the game model tell us about 
the share of penalty kicks being shot in the middle of the goal or to any of the sides. And that is, should be a very straightforward exercise. It's just a matter about of putting this information into the formula. Calculate. Of course, it's the same number here and here. And then you get an answer which looks like the following. You get R star S star equal to 0 0.2, 0 0.2. That's kind of the conversion by taking this one, putting it in there. And what it tells you then to answer the question is that 20% of the penalty kicks are shot in the middle of the goal. The rest, 80%, are shot wide. That's what the game model tells you based on this information. Of course, the same holds for the keeper, although we're not asked about that here. Then F says, assume now you observed a different league, called League 2 here, where only 10% of the penalty kicks are shot in the middle of the goal. How would you estimate or judge the quality on executors and keepers in League 2 compared to League 1? Maybe a, a slightly more complex question, but again, you have to use what you have here. Okay, it uh, shouldn't be that difficult. Because now we know something, don't we? We know that if p equals 0 0.75, then we get 0 0.2 here. So we make a change now. We say that now suddenly this value is not 0 0.2, but it's 0 0.1, which is 10%. So then you can say 1 minus p over 2 minus p should suddenly equal 0 0.1. Okay, so we can use this new information to recalculate this p. And maybe then you can compare these piece and then, based on that, say something about the quality. So, of course, we have to solve this equation then to find the p. Okay, let's do that. 1 minus p equals 0 0.1 times, you have to multiply that on the side. Then we get 1 minus p equals 0 0.1 times 2 is 0 0.2, isn't it? Minus 0 0.1 p. Just solving this simple equation. Okay. Uh, if we move the p on the right side and 9 minus uh, 0 0.2 on the left side, we get 1 minus 0 0.2 equal to mi minus 0 0.1 p plus p, don't we? When we move that on the right hand side, we have to change the sign. So we get, then we get 0 0.8 equal to 0 0.9 p, don't we? So p equals 0 0.8 over 0 0.9, which is something. Uh, I don't remember that, so maybe I should look at the solution here. It's around 0 0.88. So p is close to 0 0.88. Now this p here, according to the def def definition, says something about the amount of goals scored on a penalty, don't they? Given that the keeper and the executor kind of both choose the wide strategy. It says here in the start, doesn't it? Uh, where does it says? It says. In figure one, P gives the probability of a goal given a W W strategy. So it says something about the combined quality of the keeper and the executor, doesn't it? The higher this piece, the more goals there is in this situation. So either the executors are better, or the keepers are worse, or both. So when you move from a situation where 75% of the shots return in the goal into another league with actually 88%, there must be a change in quality here. So here, either executors are better or keepers are worse. Both these two situations would change a situation from 0 0.75 upwards. Okay. Or of course both, but you really don't know more than that. And this is the problem with this model, we are not able to separate the quality 
between the keeper and the executor. You can see that the kind of it's the combined quality that we are, are able to measure here. But that is the answer I'm looking for in sub-question F here. There are more goals in the situation where the executor shoots wide and the keeper goes for the ball. Either meaning that the executors are better in shooting penalties or that keepers are better in saving them or both. So you see you can use this for fun stuff. Okay, You can observe leagues and you can estimate these numbers. And then you can actually see that in certain, let's say in Bulgaria or in Romania or whatever, they have this P of 0 0.6, while in Premier League it's 0 0.75, for instance. Okay, And that tells you something about uh, their qualities, the kind of combined qualities in making penalties enter the goal. The home team here has had some very bad penalty experiences this year, haven't they? They lost, lost the most important match of the year against this Ukrainian team due to the fact that Vegard Foran first missed the penalty, then ran back and shoot the ball in his own goal just a minute after. This is something that should never happen. Okay? It's okay that you miss a penalty. It's sometimes okay that you make an own goal. But two, two of these at the same time, that is just too unlikely, isn't it? That should never happen. And of course, when the consequence is that the team loses 35 million Nor Norwegian crowns, ah, what can you say? I would not be happy with this one if I were the coach of Molde. This is, um, of course, after this, Vegard Foden hasn't taken the penalty. After that, uh, <laughs> Muhammad El Yunusli took one, and he also missed, if I remember correctly, in the same match. Of course, at that point, there was a, a negative standing. But um, it was 2-1, I think, to Luhansk at that point, and they got the second penalty. And even if he had made a goal, it wouldn't be enough, because it, uh, the away goal rule would kill Mulder. This kind of tells us that when the importance of taking a penalty kick increases, then the quality of the players decreases. Okay. So it's only crazy football players who are able to make goals on penalty kicks in the World Championship final, isn't it? It's a good sign that the player misses these kind of penalties because the pressure is so big. The normal human reaction is not to, to perform, is it? So those who perform in those situations, they are very abnormal. Okay? They are not like the rest of us. That could be possible in that situation, but very negative in other situations, couldn't it? You never know what these guys can, can find, find on doing. So in the big picture, of course, Vega Foren is a sensible person. He reacts as he should, even though he made something very bad in this situation. So the only thing we can do is to hope for the next year, and let's hope they at least make it into European League then. We will see. Unfortunately, of course, they will lose some players now. I assume that uh, Martin Linnes will vanish, Erjan Nyland will, maybe even Foden will disappear. And uh, Then it's a question whether they are able to replace these players. I'm not sure. We will see. Okay, that was the final part of the first exercise, wasn't it? So, in 26 minutes, we have done 50% of the exam. So, there is still more than three and a half hours left, okay? So, you see, there is, uh, should be enough time here. Of course, I haven't written this down. I've just spoken it. But uh, it should be possible to write it down in almost the same amount of time. But I urge you to try to write so I can read it, okay? If I can't read it, you get nothing. Another good advice, always try to answer all exercises. Do not leave anything blank. If you cannot answer, then write something. Okay, write a little poem, something about yourself, your biggest secret, whatever. Okay? Uh, but do not try to communicate directly with me. That, uh, that's not, we normally we don't do that, because I don't know who you are. Okay? So, what was this? I got a message here. What? Okay. 
We don't have time anyway. Okay, then we move to exercise 2, where there is a table. And on the top of this table it says in English the number of passes in percent by the scoring team before a goal. And we have seen this table before, haven't we? It's a part of the master thesis of Egil Olsen, almost 50 years ago it was written at the Norwegian University of Sport and Exercise, I believe it's called, Idrettshøyskolen. And here it says, the information in table 1 is gathered from Egil Olsen's master thesis, 1974 actually, sorry, not 64. 74, that starts to be some years, 80, 90, yeah, it's 50 years ago, isn't it? This year. So there's a 50 year anniversary for Egil Olsen's master thesis, maybe for only 40. I mean, you see, I, c I can't calculate numbers, but I'm very good at calculating letters. That is my force. So 84, 94, 24, yeah, you're right, 40 years, yeah. <laughs> 2014 minus 1974 should be 40. Okay, so in 10 years there will be a 50 years anniversary for this. You should read this one, have you? You should definitely read it, it's really funny. It's uh, a great historical uh, uh, depiction of football. It's, uh, it's really interesting. You must read it, if you have time. Um, then it says, nay, explain how this information was used to construct a playing system for the Norwegian national football team in the 80s and 90s. Then, of course, the answer is straightforward. Uh, presumably, by this table, you can observe that a minimal number of passes produces more goals than a maximum number of passes. So then, you could try to construct a playing system where you do not choose to send the ball very much between your own players, but try to focus more directly on the goal. That's kind of the type of answer I would like you to answer there. And then, how would you, with your knowledge in game theory, assess the possibilities that such a strategy is viable, that it lives on, that is continuously we give success over a longer, longer time period. And the answer of that, uh, in that is kind of, I am expecting here, is of course, that you would not expect it to be viable. It should not live, because if it's successful, then the other agents would observe that, and then they would start making countermeasures. And the problem with this strategy is that it's extremely easier, easy to produce countermeasures, okay? You can just do the same. As opposed to, for instance, the Barcelona strategy, which is much harder to find countermeasures against. Okay. We know some countermeasures about uh, how, how to play against Barcelona if they are at their best. And the idea then, of course, is you know that Barcelona is spending a lot of time trying to win the ball back. Then, of course, they use a lot of players. That must mean that at other parts of the pitch, there must be less Barcelona players. Okay. So the idea then is that the moment you get the ball, you have to get it at the player which is as far away as the Barcelona players as possible. But that will have to be done with preciseness to make it efficient. The problem is, of course, that this is difficult. Because you, you need some time to kind of control the ball, and at that moment, all these Barcelona players are over you, catching the ball, and then continuing their, their play. So we know kind of how to perform the con countermeasures against Barso this kind of strategy, but it's hard to implement. Okay? It, 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 it means a quality necessity that most teams don't have. So there are certain strategies that are kind of robust against countermeasures. There are other strategies that are kind of easy to implement, but typically not as robust as the Norwegian strategy. The Norwegian strategy turned out to be robust because the, counter, the simplest countermeasuring strategy was not suitable for these snobbish other teams. Okay? Brazil, Holland, Germany, France wouldn't like to push long balls, okay? They would prefer to keep their strategy. But in the long run, you couldn't expect it to last. And it didn't last, did it? It was killed seven or eight years after. Perhaps by the Moroccan team in uh, the World Championships in 98. So that is the answer to be here, okay? You can answer a lot and a little. Look at my uh, solution to, to find a, perhaps a more efficient answer. Okay, maybe we are able to finish this exam today. I think that we can try to do that.
Okay. Exercise 3 is 30%. Now we have finished 70%, haven't we? Table 2, which is the table above here, defines a probabilistic version of a football match where the team's strategies are chosen simultaneously before the match. Explain the meaning of the probabilities P12, P21 and PD in Table 2. So that's the first question, and that's straightforward. P12 is the probability that Team 1 beats Team 2 given either a choice of strategies O or O, O, D, O, O, D or D, D. So there are four P12s, isn't it? This whole column here, and they are given these choices here. P21 is the opposite probability, the probability that Team 2 beats Team, team 1, again condi conditioned on the same decisions, and PD is the probability of a draw. So in this case we have kind of written up all three of them. Of course they should sum to 1, 38 plus 38 is 76 plus 24, which is 1, yeah. This is 81 plus 19, this is 81 plus 19, that's 1, and it's 70 plus 3 is 1, so it seems to be correct here. And explain how these are used to calculate payoffs, the four last columns in the table. So we have four columns here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And, and we have given that this is a 310 point system and this is a 210 system. So the explanation here is meant that you have to write up some equations here, then not so many perhaps. That this uh, first number, 1.38 in the 310 system, hopefully could be found by taking this 0 0.38 times 3 plus 0 0.24 times 1 for team 1. And of course, you should expect the same to happen here. You? These, these two should be equal due to the fact that you have an equal probability there. And these two should be equal as they are, as they are here and here. But here you get a little swap. On the 2 1 system, you can calculate exactly the same by just. Uh, it should be 1.0, and it's found by taking 0 0.38 times 2 plus. 0.24 times 1. So now I'm looking at this number and this number. That should be enough, basically. Of course, you should calculate here and see that it's correct. Okay, 3 times 8 is 24, 3 times 9, 10, 11, 1.14 should this be, plus 0.24, that is 1.38. So it seems to be correct. Okay, that was the answer to sub-question A here. First, explain the meaning, then do some calculations to, to show that you know how you can kind of move from this information into that and that information. And then in B, is it reasonable to assess the two teams, T1 and T2, as equally good. State reasons for your answer. So when I write that, it means, of course, you can also just yes to that, can't you? Because that is the answer. They are. But when I, I, I add state reasons, it means that you should write a little bit more than just yes. Okay, I want you to explain why. And then you should write something like, okay, we see here that if they choose the common strategy, they have the same probability for beating each other. At least in those situations, they are equally good. And when we see here, we see there is a swap here. So if one chooses one strategy, the other chooses none, then we could expect that there could be differences in their probabilities of winning. But the logic then should be that if you, we swap it back, then we must also swap the probabilities, which we see that this content holds. That is the type of answer I would like you to give. So always, when there is state reasons for your answer, or in Norwegian Svar is called Begrunnes, then you have to write a little bit more than just yes or no or 1.0 or whatever. Okay. So that is the signal to you that to get a full point score on that sub-question you need to add a little bit more than just the straightforward answer to the question. 
and then in C you're asked to construct two game matrices one for each of the two point systems of course you have the information here already okay it's just a matter of putting these up okay then you have to write it down okay if this is the 310 system then it's a matter about taking this number and place them correctly. Okay, 001.38 should be here on player one. OD that's the second, third line. Then it's 1.42. DO it's the second line. 1.39, isn't it? Uh, find one DD. 1.35 it's down here. Then you then we have taken the payoffs for player one or team one. Then we have to do the same for on top of the diagonal. So you, you just repeat this for both of these two part tables to produce not only this one but another one which also contains the top values. And find all Nash equilibria in pure strategies in the two games. This is a direct part of the textbook, isn't it? It's the same example as we looked at in the textbook. So if we look back on the textbook here, we can find this example directly. So instead of writing it up, let's go there, okay? This is the kind of last example we looked at in chapter 4. And this is the numbers and the point score systems and the finished tables or matrices. So this is what we're looking at here now. We are, we are trying to find the Nash equilibrium. Of course, we do that straightforwardly. Turns out that in the 2, 1, 0 system, we get this OO equilibrium. And in this situation, we got this double one where there's one of the teams chooses to play defensively. And the, the, the point of this example, of course, was to show that given some kind of interpretation of these probabilities and they're linked to the meaning of offensive versus defensive play we can at least in this case pinpoint an example where it turns out that moving from the original system to the new one does not lead to more offensive play because this is the opposite that happens here we move from a totally offensive situation to a situation where there is defensive choices so we are kind of not guaranteed that these change will lead into more offensive play. Of course, in general, in the most of the cases, it will, because these numbers are fairly special. Okay. And there are equal teams and so on. So, But uh, the point here is simply to demonstrate that we do not, we cannot guarantee that there will be more offensive play when we, when we increase this point system, even if it seems logical. So game theory kind of goes deeper in here and tells us, OK, we can actually construct situations where it, we, sh we should expect less offensive play, even when we reward the teams for more for winning. So that answers question C and then commenting on the results we perhaps already have done, haven't we? So you should just find that and then I have given my comments now, haven't I, to, to this, this concept of of not guaranteeing um, more offensive play in this, that situation. But this is an exam that everybody of you should get an A on, isn't it? More or less. Everybody should pass it, at least. If you spend a little time before the exam, memorizing a little bit, reading through the material, of course, it's always easy when I tell you what the answer should be. So when you are there, you have to formulate things. And it, uh, but uh, as long as you write the way I can read it, okay? I don't care much about the language here, okay? I don't care about commas and periods and that kind of stuff. As long as you can are able to express the correct answer, the way you do it doesn't mean much. 
So you don't get grades to me on your ability to either write Norwegian or English. Okay, that's, that's not the point. The point here is to express the answers to the question you are given related to these topics. Of course, if you write nicely, that may improve your grade because it makes my experience as a grader much better. So I don't say that it's out of value, but it's nothing that kind of kills you or makes you a hero. So the, the point here is to learn game theory, basically, and to understand how it can be applied in sports economics or in sports strategy or whatever we like to call the things we, we talk about here. That is the main point. And that is what I like to test you in. Whether you have understood what we have talked about here, at what level you have understood it. Okay, do we have any questions, comments? There are still three exams left. We have to use next week on these three. Then after that is the final week. Then maybe we skip them on the lecture and let Sonrik Koffer give you a guest lecture on that final Tuesday. You know, Sondre, he has uh, been a long life in football, so he has some meanings, I think, about strategy and tactics and whatever. Okay. And he will tell you some nice stories about all his trips to Ukraine and Bulgaria and all the mafia he has met and whatever. Okay. That might be interesting. So that's the plan. So uh, we meet again on Monday, continuing with the ex exam from 2010 and then moving on. Okay, that ends today's lectures.